Okay, welcome to this episode. This is the final episode of shotgun making YouTube videos. I'm going to slow down from now on. We're going to have intros, we're going to have music, we're going to have cartoons, we're going to have fun. This is the last of the old style. I'm saying that to myself because I'm going to force myself to do it. There's a battle I have in my head with this voice that tells me I should be releasing two to three of these a day. So this is the last of that, and I feel like I've lost the war, that I'm losing something, that somebody's something's dying. So it's a battle I have to have starting Monday, um, because I can't live like this. I can't gun these out. So we're going to listen to, we're going to do some more galing, and so far watching Chuck's version, Chuck quoting Gal's garbage, New Age Bible versions. We've created a new one, number nine, Gad Hominin attack. This is when Gal can't fault the material, so she attacks the people. Uh, and we're going to call them Waistcoat and Sport. Yeah, Sport. Sport's a better name. Waistcoat and Sport. In the Nonsense Town version of this. That's why I created Nonsense Town for these two special awesome dudes. So, go Chuck. Give us some gal quotes. The headquarters for the Gnostics was at Alexandria. It was a major center of influence. Which has nothing to do with Greek manuscripts. Now these courtesies, as I've mentioned, these three Alexandrian courtesies are the primary reliance of most modern translations. Correct. There and, it is uh, there. One of the things that we're going to discover is that in the, in the uh, tides or attitudes of scholarship, um, in the 19th century, more and more, uh, there was a disparagement of Textus Receptus and a veneration of the Alexandrian courtesies, saying that because the Textus Receptus was written in 1512 A.D. by Erasmus, and it included manuscript 1, 1 AP, 2 E, 2 AP, 4 AP, 7 817. That's the manuscript evidence used for the Textus Receptus. Whereas now we have Dead Sea Scrolls, we have the 76 at the time of this press printing edition, 76 papyri, like a ton of codices all over the world. There's like 80, 119, 250. Then we've got like thousands of minuscules and all this that the holy Texas Receptus didn't have. I've already done that on Gail's chart. Okay. Next the Alexander point. courtesies were the oldest complete manuscript. We'll lean more on them and less on Texas Receptus. True, because they're closer than the bloated 11th, 12th, 15th century manuscripts used by the translators of the King James. That was fashionable up until maybe 10 years ago, and we're going to see what the benefit of that is. So what you want to believe, Gail, is that Bruce Smitzka... Did they do this one as well? I'm sure they're behind most of them. Yeah, Kurt Arland. Oh, no, this is Eberhard Nessel. Oh, I did a King James mistake, sorry. Eberhard Nestle. Erwin Nestle. Kurt Arland, Matthew Black, Carlo Mantini, Bruce Metzger, Alan Wittgren. Um, he's saying that their lifetime work uh, has now out of date even though they release a new version every three years because of new manuscripts that have been discovered mm -hmm. Texas Receptus begins to get dethroned when Johannes Albert Bengel in the so by 1730 Johannes Bengel accumulated more manuscripts than Erasmus had good on him another hero of mine 17 
30s produced a text that deviated from Textus Receptus, relying on earlier manuscripts. Good on him. Carl Lechman produced a text with 4th century manuscripts. So they're, they're discovering more and more. Okay, we're seeing how it's going. This is cool. No, I mean, you know, I'm not in religion anymore, but just the, the discovery of, of scrolls and manuscripts, it's my thing. Like Indiana Jones, but with manuscripts instead of crystal skulls and Noah's Ark. I mean, the Ark of the Covenant. Because the Ark of the Covenant, as we all know, contains the golden text of the 1611 King James Bible. <laughs> In 1831, Carl Lachman produced a text that represented the 4th century Alexandrian codices. Cool. So, Lachman must have found the uh, Alexandrinus Codex. Okay. And then Trigallus, who would. Trigallus found the Sinaiticus, 1857, 1872. And he spent his lifetime, what a dude, publishing the Greek text that came out in six editions, 1857, 1872. What a dude, he's my hero. He's a self-taught in Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. Spent his wow. lifetime publishing a Greek text that came out uh, before the end of the 19th century. But the point is, these Alexandrian codices that uh, emerged... Um, uh, well, they were presumably actually were codified in the 4th, 5th century. They were discovered in the, in the 16th, 17th century, are beginning to influence Correct. the modern translations, the NIV and others. And uh -huh. so the question is, are they really reliable? Is the answer is yes. It's been very fashionable to lean heavily on these codices and less on Texas Receptus, and let's see what the difference are. The difference is 400 years. 1502 to 1902, 16, 17, 18, 19, that's 400 and, it's nearly 500 years now, I can't count. 500 years difference between the two, Gail. There are two guys that you'll hear a lot about. There's a guy by the name of Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort, Westcott and Hort. Whoops. So this is ad hominem. Um, well, I'll put, I've just put waistcoat in sport because that's the nonsense stand version. She can't attack their work, so she attacks their person. And she does this by saying that William Wynne Westcott, who was a spiritualist, somehow did a derrick and chainsawed the body of Brock Foster Westcott, Westcott and wore his skin around him like Ed Gein would wear a woman's skin around his body. <laughs> That's why I love this stuff. Oh, God. They were Anglican churchmen, and they had contempt for Texas Receptus. Yeah, it was 500 years out of date, mate. And uh, so they began a work in 1853. After 28 years, they spent in a Greek New Testament based on Vaticanus. And so they actually saw the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. They had access to it. Oh my God, seriously? Oh, nerd movement. Nerdgasm. Sinaiticus, the two of the what we now regard as corrupt manuscripts. Only the King James, only cult regard them as corrupt. They were influenced by Oregon and others who denied the deity of Jesus Christ. So Oregon living in Exa Alexandria changed a book that was in Rome. Wow. Broomsticks. Broomsticks. That's it. Professor McGonagall taught Oregon how to use a broomstick. Damn, dude traveled so far. So then Oregon in Alexandria was able to mentally project his thoughts to Rome and write the Codex 
Vaticanus that's been in the Vatican since 330 AD. Wow, this is amazing stuff. Damn. What, what's, the, what's the potion for transferring your thoughts? Only Dumbledore's got that bowl. I don't know how it was done. There, there should be some Bible scholars out there that can tell me how it was done. Brace the Gnostic heresies of the period from the headquarters of the Gnostics in Alexandria. Which had nothing to do with Oregon, who was a heretic. He was an outcast of the Christians and the Gnostics. <laughs> this is getting this is just getting ridiculous. There are over three thousand contradictions in the four gospels alone. Correct, because the 11th, 12th, 15th century manuscripts that ended up being the King James Bible had 64,500 odd extra words added, according to Les Garrett's quote of Gal Ripplinger. So yeah, there would be a lot of contradictions, because a lot of words were added over the thousand years that didn't exist in the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus from the third 300 AD I don't know how centuries work is that the second century or the fourth century I don't know between these manuscripts fourth if you add a hundred I'm confused they changed the, tra the, the the first day at university when we were studying would have been Greek he wrote a big thing on the board. BC is this way, AD is that way. It was so cool. I still remember that one. Traditional yeah. Greek in over 8,000 places. Correct. Now, Westcott and Hort, they found, just to give you some background, these two. Here comes the ad hominem attacks from Gail Ripplinger. And they're starting to move up to the line. Two characters. They're regarded by, as the greatest Greek scholars and so forth. Let's look. Um, well, they would, yeah. Well, they did. They were. They studied, they, they like studied Homer as a hobby. And not in English. They, they studied Homer in the Attic Greek, which is a different form of Greek to the Koine Greek the Bible's written in. They're, they're my heroes. Into this a little bit. They founded the Hermes Club, where they... Venerate the messenger of the gods, the guide for departed souls. It was a book club where they drank tea and had scones. Buttered scones. How can you twist something so poorly, Gail? Oh, God. In 1851, they started a guild at Cambridge, quote, to conduct serious and earnest inquiry. The ghostly guild to scientifically... Um, study the spirit world. It can't be studied under a microscope, therefore they stopped the study shortly after they started it, because as the son said, for lack of a better word, we'll get to it. Keep the audience hanging. And the nature of supernatural phenomenon. Call that spiritism, all right? And... Uh, You've got the you've got the PDF files up on your screen there, Chuck. You should check and read those before you spout gals garbage. Westcott's son said his father's quote faith in what for a better name one must call spiritism close. Correct. He came to the conclusion that anybody trying to investigate the spirit realm, it couldn't be done scientifically, therefore they would have to be a spiritualist. So he wanted nothing to do with it after that is what his son meant but when you're Gail Ripplinger and you don't have facts you attack Westcott and his son why not ad hominem and ad hominem minus quote many in a letter to Archbishop Canterbury Westcott wrote quote no one now I suppose hold that the first three chapters of Genesis for example give a literal history if Gail had read Brookfast Westcott, Life and Letters, Brookfast Westcott, she'd realise that he was being sarcastic here. 
uh, English have this this thing, and it's in Monty Python, it's in everything. Faulty Towers, Two Runnies, it's everywhere. It's called sarcasm. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Gail knows what sarcasm is. Never mind. So, yeah, never mind. He's just mocking people. That, from his perspective as an Anglican bishop, he believed Genesis was literal truth and he was offended by people that didn't believe that, so he's using sarcasm. What's reality got to do with this? Nothing. I could never understand how anyone reading them with open eyes could think they did. So he's almost saying it in a sarcastic way, but he doesn't realize he's quoting Gale, so he can't see where the original quote, goat, comes from. So the point is they're not believers. They were Anglican bishops and stuff. Butthead. No, don't attack Chuck. It's Gale. Okay, sorry. In April 3rd, 1860, Hart wrote, but the book which has engaged me most is Darwin. What? Because it was fresh out. So 1881, it would have been 21 years old. And he detested the book because he was raised a creationist um, and he's being very flippant here this is by the way this is a letter to a friend of his it has nothing to do with anything to do with the current work of translating the Greek may be thought of it it is a book that one is proud to be contemporary with my feeling is strong that the theory is unanswerable this yeah sarcasm <laughs> tidy this is what's view <laughs> how about the universal fatherhood of god westcott believed that the universal fatherhood of god in reference to john 10 28 and 29 he wrote the thought which is concrete in verse 28 is here traced back to its most absolute form is resting on the essential power of god in his relation of universal fatherhood uh, which is true there's no problem with that Wiscott said Christians were Christ. Christians are themselves, in a true sense, Christ. In the particular passage, he was, this, this is from not, yeah, this is from the epistles of St. John. If you read the entire chapter, you get what he's getting at. The, the, so we'll call this Gee Search. I'm sorry, I haven't done that one yet. I'm just moving the keyboard. I've got to fill a menu box. 10 is G-Search. G-H-E search. It's when you don't do any research. If she'd read the book, she wouldn't be promoting all these garbage lies and neither would Chuck regurgitating her bullshit. That's his Christology. <laughs> Hort said, I am inclined to think that no such state as Eden, I mean the popular notion, ever existed and that Adam's fall in no degree differed from the fall of each of his descendants. You have to read the entire chapter again. He's being flippant. God. There is no mighty python in America. They don't know what humor is. So, yeah. Okay. That's why American comedy doesn't... I mean, proper comedy doesn't work in America. He also wrote to Westcott, I entirely agree, having many years believed that the absolute union of Christian, or rather of man, with Christ himself is the spiritual truth of which the, the popular doctrine of substitution is an immoral and material counterfeit. Certainly noting could be, uh, uh, certainly nothing could be more unscriptural than the modern limiting of Christ bearing on our sins, bearing our sins and suffering to his death but that is only one aspect of an almost universal heresy. Which was, was it Murdoch's? I've forgotten his name. It's in another episode. They were debating this this guy who had some rather strange beliefs. If Chuck had the life and letters of Westcott before him, not just reading Gale's material, uh, you'd read it in context of what he's talking about. This is goating again. When you, you just pinch bits 
of anything and stuff it together, calling it a quote. This is the, these are the guys we're talking about here. Yeah, but what Gale has written is garbage. It's ad hominem attacks. She's like, the words that they're saying, three of the words in this quote you see on the screen could be from a book from 1885, and the next sentence could be from a book from five years before that. There's, these are called goats. Like, not just quotes from different chapters, but from different books. That's bizarre. Or says, I confess I have, no repug I have no repugnance to the primitive doctrine of ransom paid to Satan, though neither am I prepared to give full assent to it. But I can see no other possible form in which the doctrine of a ransom is at all tenable. Anything is better than the notion of a ransom paid to the Father. So that's uh, his reference to Matthew 20. From many different books written years apart. And not all of those words were his words. Gail made up a whole lot of those words herself. Wow. Hort writes to uh, another letter. He says, finally, St. Paul's mysterious words, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. I have labored so utterly to apprehend in any measure what th his, this idea is. I hope you will deepen and widen the hints you have already given. I am quite conscious that I have given but few distinct objections to the common belief, redemption through the blood of the Lamb, in what I have written. But so indeed it must be, language cannot accurately define the, tw the twinge of shrinking horror. He's having a hard time reading Gal's quotes, goats, sorry, because they come from different chapters, different pages, different books. And if you read it as though it's supposed to be a quote, it doesn't even make English sense. Hmm. Which mixes with my thought when I hear the popular notion of sudden. Westcott denies the sinlessness of Christ. He says the concept is that of bringing Christ to the full perfection of his humanity, which carries with it the completeness of power and dignity. The perfection was not reached till after death. That's a Calvinistic point of view. So who cares? I don't care anymore. If that's the Calvinist view, then so be it. I don't care. Boy. And again, Westcott says, The resurrection seems to me to be the image of man unfallen to a higher life, not future but present. Not I shall be hereafter, but I am. Taken from many books written in many months apart. Again, very new age. I have been persuaded for many years that the Mary worship and Jesus worship have very much in common with their causes and results. And he was right. What, it, what had happened in this case, he'd gone to a Catholic church and being an Anglican, he was horrified by these statues of Mary and all this all over the place. And he was quite upset. And that's why he's also put the pure Romish view seems to be nearer and more likely to lead to the truth than the evangelical. So, without the text in front of me, the whole book, uh, it's been a year since I've last did this le lesson, this reaction or response to Gail's Chuck Missler material. Mm. And also from what he says, the pure Romish view seems to be nearer and more likely to lead to truth than the evangelical. And then Hort even is recorded as having said, purgatory is a great important truth. These are the great important truth to the Catholics. When you're doing a, a quote, you have to quote the whole sentence, not just one, two, three, four, five, six words out of a paragraph. It doesn't work. That's not a quote. The guys, Hort denies that heaven is literal. It's hardly necessary to say that this whole local language is figurative folly that this, this sentence may have nothing to do with First Peter 1.4 because we don't know what parts of what sentence Gales used from which page number. It says page 39 here, but some of these words could be from page 52 for all we know. And he goes on. The true lesson is that language speaks of a ransom is but figurative. Hort, Same uh, argument. 
It says that appearance of Christ is figurative. Nothing is nothing in either this passage or others on the same subject apart from the figurative language of the Thessalonians to show that the revelation here spoken of is to be limited to a sudden prenatural theophany. It may be long and varying process, though ending in a climax. So what? And uh, he described Texas Receptus as vile and villainous. All he should do is 500 years out of date. On it goes. How certainly I... This is the one part he says that I agree with. Westcott admits, quote, how certainly I should have been proclaimed a heretic. This is one of the most disgusting quotes from Gale because right here he's defending the truth from Morris, the Morris controversy. It just came to me. So this dude Morris was promoting some sort of heresy teaching at the... Now, don't forget, in this world, Gale's world, Oxford and Cambridge are the same university. Just, just how it works in her world. So some guy at Ox Oxford, Cambridge, like Doom is Hexen, Doom is Quake, Doom Quake is a game created by ID Software but never released to the public, and Stephen Dolan says the only version of it in existence. Um, Morris was a heretic, and to Morris, Westcott responding to his heresy, got called a heretic for responding to it. So this guy's, Westcott's defending the the normal scripture, the normal theology of the day from a heretic. And Gail attacks him for doing that. That's disgusting, Gail. Close quote. Amen. You should have been. Now the question you want to answer, would you let either one of these guys teach your Sunday school class? Well, no, it'd be far too technical. They'd be quoting these out, these papyrus. They'd be teaching the kids Greek. I mean, I would have loved it. But the poor little kiddies sit down and learn some Greek now. <laughs> I don't think so. I do. And so they may know a lot about Greek, but they certainly don't know much about the Bible. Gal, you're a bitch. That's all I'm going to say. I want to show you in Westcott and Hort's tra famous translations what was deleted. Matthew 6.13, the entire... Uh, he's quoting Gale for Baton here, so we'll just end it here. However many verses he attack, uh, Gale attacks at Chuck's quoting, Matthew 6.13 is a repeat of another verse in the Bible, therefore it's not in the original... Satanic Bible, meaning the Codex Vaticanus, Sonus, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Alexandrinus. So that's it. I'm finished. Chuck Bissler was the last one. No more shooting fast out, uploading as fast as possible type videos from now on for Monday morning. It's going to be slow. There's going to be a lot of airplanes. There's going to be lightsabers. There's going to be Harry Potter's wand with a stag coming out of it. Just special effects and yeah, let's move on to that. Yep, okay.